he had a reputation, a good one, a reputation for being righteous and upright. A good reputation can go a long way in life, and you may lose a lot of things along the way, but you never lose, you never want to lose your reputation as a good and upright person. And so Joseph's reputation would surely play a part in the difficult decision that he was facing. Here he was engaged to a young girl whom he thought would make a suitable wife, someone who seemed like a good match, someone who would be faithful. But he must have been wrong. Not only had she apparently not been faithful, but her swelling belly indicated she was pregnant. And it wasn't his child because they hadn't had sex yet. He had a reputation to uphold, remember. None of the options that lay before him looked good, especially his first option, which was to publicly expose her. That's what the biblical fundamentalists would certainly have preferred. The law was very clear about the matter. If evidence of the young woman's virginity was not found, then they shall bring the young woman out to the entrance of her parents' house, and the men of her town shall stone her to death, because she committed a disgraceful act in Israel by prostituting herself in her parents' house, so shall you purge the evil from your midst. But Joseph wasn't a religious fundamentalist. He took the Bible seriously, but not literally. There was a second option, though, a quiet divorce. And this was looking more and more appealing to Joseph. He would return Mary to her family because, after all, when he agreed to purchase her as his wife, he hadn't counted on damaged goods. We read in the Bible that he was unwilling to expose her to public disgrace because he was just that kind of guy, a good guy, a righteous and upright sort of guy, a guy whose actions reflected his concern for Mary. But let's be clear about something. Divorce would have been devastating for Mary. It might have allowed her to live, but without a husband to support her, Mary would have been reduced to begging for a living or forced into prostitution. And Joseph knew that. And the child? The child with whom she was pregnant would grow up without a family name. This option to divorce her may have been one that suited Joseph and his reputation but certainly not Mary, nor her unborn child. But Joseph's mind was pretty much settled, and so just before setting out to return Mary to her family, he decided to rest up so he could face the journey clear-headed and refreshed. But his sleep was restless and filled with dreams. And in one of those dreams, an angel appeared to him, providing him with a third option, an option he hadn't even seriously considered, the option to marry a seemingly unfaithful woman, the option to risk his reputation by tainting himself with her sin. The option of nurturing an interloper into his family because, after all, Mary's son would stand to inherit the birthright that rightfully belonged to Joseph's biological child. That's what the angel in this dream was proposing, and to seal the deal, he was to name the child Jesus because that means God is salvation or God saves. And he did. He did exactly what the angel in his dream told him to do. And I believe he did it because he came to the understanding that this unborn child was more than an inconvenience and embarrassment. He was a creation of God. 
In fact, according to the angel, he was conceived from the very spirit of God. And to throw Mary out along with the baby would have been nothing less than to throw out God. Just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. It's been more than 2,000 years and it seems like the church hasn't learned much. It's just as uncomfortable for the church to deal openly with sexual behavior as it was in Jesus' day. And the options are pretty much the same as they were for Joseph. Today's religious fundamentalists justify their mean-spirited attitudes toward the LGBT community by clinging to a few verses in the Bible which they interpret as condemnation of same-sex relationships. If they had their way, they would publicly execute us. And in some countries, that's exactly what they do, all in the name of God. Our country, though, is too civilized for that sort of thing. We do our executions in the alleys and back streets where no one can see. But there is another option, and that is for the church to quietly divorce itself from the controversy by refusing to recognize same-sex relationships or by allowing them to be a part of the church as long as they know their place. No Eucharist, no leadership position, no ordination of LGBT clergy, and no advocacy for equal rights. You are welcome to be a part of the congregation as long as you don't flaunt your homosexuality. In other words, please stay in your closet because it's just too uncomfortable for the rest of us otherwise. But there is a third option, an op option which gave rise to MCC churches. A controversial transgressive option which more and more mainstream churches are beginning to choose and that is to fully embrace the LGBT community as children of God. But there's a risk you take when you choose this option. Your reputation is at stake you see. Locally, Lakeshore Baptist Church is learning that. Under the leadership of Reverend Kendall Rothaus, Lakeshore Baptist Church has approved a change to its bylaws, describing itself as a welcoming and affirming community of Christians. We affirm each individual as a child of God and created in God's image. Our welcome holds no bounds, we welcome all persons into membership and full participation in the life and ministry of our congregation. These seemingly innocuous words have rankled the sensibilities of the Baptist General Convention of Texas, which has pledged to expel churches who affirm the LGBT community. And so we need to be in prayer for Lakeshore Baptist Church and support them and other churches who are choosing to be in relationship with the LGBT community. These churches are discovering that God is present when they welcome the lesbian, gay man, bisexual, or transgender person into their midst. Thankfully, members of MCC are ahead of the curve when it comes to sexuality and spirituality. We know that we are children of God regardless of our sexual orientation or gender identity. We've known that all along. But before we start patting ourselves on the back, we might want to take a look at who else we might be trying to quietly divorce. While other churches are having conversations about homosexuality and trying to figure out how to be in relationship with the LGBT community, we also need to be having our own conversations. We need to be having conversations about race, about homelessness, 
about immigrants, about refugees, and about religious pluralism. We've got a whole lot of work to do because we aren't nearly as diverse as we like to imagine ourselves. One of the foretold names of the Messiah in the Hebrew Bible was Emmanuel, which means God is with us. According to Matthew's Gospel, that name refers to Jesus Christ. But I believe the name can apply to each of us as we become willing to be in community with others. I believe that God is with us when we hear the story of a person of a different color than our own. God is with us when we welcome the immigrant. God is with us when we advocate that our city be a sanctuary city for refugees. God is with us when we treat the homeless person with dignity. God is with us when we show respect for the faith of someone who isn't Christian. Joseph took a risk when he decided to take Mary as his wife. He risked his reputation when he decided to raise Jesus as his own. We are commanded to do no less. We have been charged to welcome the stranger, the person with whom we have very little in common. And if we do, we are given the opportunity to see in that person that God is with us. Amen.